Before attempting to cross an unfordable stream with a cavalry command, certain preliminary training is essential. This training should be carried on from year to year as a part of the peacetime program for a cavalry organization, wherever facilities are available. All troopers are required to pass a test in swimming. Individuals who are unable to swim a required distance of 150 yards are placed under special instruction until they are qualified. Horses and mules are natural swimmers. Though some animals are timid about entering the water, this characteristic can usually be overcome by gradually familiarizing them with it. The boldest animals are placed in the lead in column and are ridden through shallow water. The more timid will follow with little resistance. When crossing an unfordable stream which has an appreciable current, it is well to stretch a rope from bank to bank below the crossing site to afford a handhold for those troopers who may be swept downstream. For the first lesson, the equipment used consists of a snaffle bridle, halter, and tie rope. Reins are knotted short to avoid entanglement with the horse's legs if they should slip from the rider's grasp. For the same reason, the tie rope is adjusted fairly short. Great care must be exercised to prevent any long loops in reins or tie ropes in which the horse can become entangled. The animal is then ridden into the water. Riders are instructed to take the position of the trooper mounted. The body above the waist is inclined slightly forward to meet the upthrust incident to the position of the horse's forehand and the high action of his hind legs in swimming. Hands with reins held lightly are low and grasp the halter tie rope to assist the rider in maintaining his position. Legs are kept in place with a firm grip to prevent the rider from sliding to the rear as a result of the resistance offered by the water as the horse moves forward. Another prescribed position for the rider is alongside his mount, supporting himself with his arm across the withers. This method greatly lessens the weight on the horse, but makes control of the animal difficult. Still a third method, should the rider become unseated. He grasps the horse's tail and is towed across. This position, of course, allows the rider no means of controlling his mount. As soon as the troopers have gained confidence and the horses have begun to swim freely, the troop prepares to swim with stripped saddles without arms. Before entering the stream, all saddles are adjusted. Reins and tie ropes are carefully secured. The curb reins are used as breast straps to prevent saddles from slipping to the rear. Stirrups are shortened or crossed over the pummel to prevent entanglement with the horse's hind legs during their high action while swimming. The use of stirrups is optional. However, long-legged riders should be cautioned not to allow their feet to slip out of their stirrups should they use them. The dead weight of the pack saddle constitutes a more difficult load for an inexperienced horse than the live weight of a rider. A well-conditioned animal will swim a hundred yards or more with his pack saddle if unloaded. Breast straps and bridging should be used. The rear cinch is removed and secured over the top of the saddle. The driver of the swimming pack animal must exercise great care in guiding it. Efforts to check the progress of an animal carrying a pack saddle may easily result in a serious upset. For distances over 20 yards, it is safest to ferry both packs and loads. Where no boats are available, the escort wagon may be converted into a ferry. After the bows and wagon cover have been removed, the body is lifted from the running gear and a pollen, part of the organizational equipment, is placed under the bed. This converts it into a ponton. Ends and corners of the pollen are pulled up tightly around the wagon bed, which is lashed securely to the running gear with halter tie ropes. The wheels and running gear act as ballast. The front end of the pollen should be secured well up against the footboard in order to keep out the water as the wagon is pulled through the stream. The lash ropes carried on the escort wagons are utilized as tow ropes. When the width of the stream requires it, picket lines may be used to augment the lash rope. While the rope is being crossed over the stream, a detail is engaged in loading the equipment. The load should be distributed evenly to prevent listing. The center of gravity of the load must be kept low. From 1,200 to 1,600 pounds may be loaded depending upon the bulkiness of the equipment, the stream current, and the wind. 
the loaded wagon is lowered into the water by hand and is towed across to the opposite shore by the team of mules which carried over the tow rope. In order to ferry the loads of some wagons, it is necessary to make two trips to avoid overloading and unbalancing. When hay is crossed, the wagon bows are not removed. They prevent slippage of the bales which are piled above the sideboards. The mountain wagon is difficult to float with the ordinary material available in the field. It is more expedient to remove the load and to ferry both the mountain wagon and its load on the escort wagon. A detail of about 12 men is required. The mountain wagon is backed up to the rear end of the escort wagon and is then lifted so that the bed of the mountain wagon rests across the sideboards of the escort wagon. During this operation, wheels are removed and loaded on the rear of the mountain wagon to counterbalance the heavier weight of the front end. On account of the high center of gravity, the load must be carefully centered to prevent overbalancing. During the crossing of the stream, two men are utilized to accompany the load. By shifting their positions, they are able to counterbalance listing, which may occur as a result of the stream current or from the effect of the wind. In unloading, the process of loading is reversed. As the front axle of the mountain wagon clears the rear of the escort wagon bed, the front wheels are put on. The mountain wagon is then lifted forward until the front wheels rest on the ground. Rear wheels are then replaced and the unloading completed. A regiment of cavalry is operating in hostile territory, covering the advance of an infantry division. Hostile patrols have been operating in the vicinity during the last 24 hours. Upon reaching the Nueces River, the advance guard discovers that the bridge thereover has been destroyed. The river is unfordable. The advance guard commander promptly transmits this information to the commanding officer. At the same time, he takes measures for the security of the command along the axis of advance and seeks by reconnaissance ways and means to overcome the obstacle with which he is confronted. Upon receiving the message from the advance guard commander, the commanding officer halts the column. He sends a messenger to the rear with instructions for his squadron commanders and the machine gun troop commander to join him at once for reconnaissance. He then dismounts and with his executive officer and S3 makes a hasty map study of the area with a view to effecting a crossing at some other locality. He notes that to cross by the nearest ford will necessitate a detour of 25 miles. The mobility of cavalry permits of such a detour, but on this occasion, the accomplishment of the tactical mission of the command confines its advance to the vicinity of its present route. The commanding officer decides, therefore, to force a crossing near the present location of the advance guard. Upon the colonel's order, the executive officer instructs the command to take cover against hostile air and ground observation and to await further orders. Meanwhile, the commanding officer, accompanied by his staff, the squadron commanders, and the machine gun troop commander, rides forward to the advance guard for reconnaissance. The advance card commander reports to the commanding officer that the stream is unfordable. He points out on his map possible sites near the route of march for making a crossing. The commanding officer considers each site from a practical and tactical standpoint and decides to inspect them personally. Site A has a good covered approach on the near bank and the bank will require little preparation for a crossing. Although the far bank possesses a good field of fire, it is very steep and high. It will require several hours pioneer work in order to prepare a suitable exit for animals and wagon transportation. There is good cover on the near bank at site B. The approach to the water will take little preparation. The stream is narrow at this location and the far bank offers a good field of fire. However, the site is not approved by the commanding officer on account of the marshy exit on the far bank.
Site C offers satisfactory cover and a good approach. The near bank can easily be prepared for the crossing. The site is readily accessible from the road along which the command is marching. The far bank will require only a nominal amount of pioneer work and is apparently undefended by hostile troops. The commanding officer therefore selects Site C and issues instruction for the crossing at that point. The machine gun troop is ordered to go into position at once to cover the crossing of the bridgehead troops and to protect the flanks of the main body against attack while preparing for the crossing. Accordingly, the troop comes out from under cover, mounts up, and moves forward on these missions. As soon as the machine gun troop is in position, the commanding officer directs the advance guard commander to establish a bridgehead on the far bank to cover the crossing of the main body. The point is sent over as the first unit. It takes an open formation for protection against the possibility of hostile fire. The advance party crosses as soon as the point has cleared the far bank and has had an opportunity to take up a position in observation to the front. Upon reaching the far bank, the advance party will move forward to cover the crossing of the remainder of the advance guard. The support follows. Two men of the light machine gun squad attached to the support, riding strong swimmers, carry over their guns. Two other men carry their ammunition boxes. Bridgehead troops protect the crossing of the main body, while mounted patrols are dispatched to cover the flanks. The machine gun troop, less certain detachments, is crossed to strengthen the bridgehead position. A covering force consisting of one platoon of machine guns and a 37 millimeter gun squad is left in position on the near bank until other units have completed the crossing. Light machine gun packs and their loads are prepared for ferrying by the personnel of their platoons. They are crossed as soon as practicable after the rifle units to which they pertain. The pioneer and demolition section moves forward to prepare the banks for the crossing of the trains. While wagons are being converted into ferries, personnel of this section clear away a suitable entrance on the near bank. They then cross over and prepare the exit. Once the command is committed to the crossing, the movement of troops is pushed as rapidly as possible. Where nearby approaches permit, ferrying of the pack loads of rifle troops takes place simultaneously with the crossing of the troops themselves. Advance units which follow the bridgehead troops assist on the far bank. The commanding officer conducts the commander's group across after coordinating the plans for organization of the crossing. The movement of the remainder of the troops is directed by the executive officer. The radio station is closed. Radio equipment is loaded and ferried with other headquarters troop equipment. The personnel of the rear echelon is divided into teams which cooperate in crossing all wagons. One escort wagon from each troop is reserved to ferry over the troop spring wagon. Other wagons are used for ferrying their own loads. All are assembled near the site selected for the crossing of the wagons. The band and the personnel section assist in crossing the trains. Their truck transportation is then ordered to cross at the nearest bridge and to rejoin the column at the earliest opportunity. When the last elements of the command have crossed, the commanding officer orders the march resumed. On the road once more, the regiment continues on its mission.